All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to have you here and uh, be in prayer for our pastor. He is down in um, College Heights, New Mexico, at uh, the pastor, I believe, Corley's church down there, preaching a uh, missions conference. And so he's gone today. And so today is the first day of their missions conference. I think it goes through uh, the middle part of the week, I think through Wednesday. So they'll be back later on. So be in, pra uh, in prayer, uh, not just for the travel, but also that he would be a blessing and an encouragement and be able to challenge the church there. And so um, looking forward to what we um, are meeting here today. So uh, we're going to be uh, picking up in the lesson that we began last week, looking at the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And we are in a, a sort of a series. I don't want to call it a mini series. I, I think it could go on for a long, long time. Uh, so a major series. Um looking at the the earthly life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Of course, uh, the first off, we, we've we established that Christ uh, has always existed. He was the eternal God, and so there was a ministry before his incarnation or his um, taking on flesh. That's what the word incarnation means, to embody flesh. And uh, the amazing thing, the the mystery, uh, as these verses um, up on the screen talk about, the amazing thing, it really is incomprehensible in a lot of ways to understand that the eternal God took on flesh and became man. He was 100% man, but he was also 100% God, sinless, perfect, um, all-knowing, all-powerful, yet he... Uh, uh, took on flesh. And the Bible says in John chapter 1 and verse 14, it declares this very fact that the Word, that's speaking of Jesus, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we're going to be looking at the earthly life of Jesus Christ. And we know uh, that he did walk on this earth for uh, three and a half years. Well, I guess if he, he maybe wasn't walking as an infant. Maybe it took him six months. So he walked for 30 years. Um, but uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, tells us, And without great co controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. And so we have the word was made flesh. God was manifested in the flesh. And you have to understand that Jesus Christ is God. And uh, the, the um, and so we see uh, the Bible declaring that we uh, before we get into the actual birth of Jesus, and we're going to cover that, um, Lord willing, next week. Um, turn over to Matthew chapter one is uh, where we're going to be uh, to start things off. By way of quick review, last week we looked at the announcements leading up to the birth of Jesus. And we didn't get through all of these angelic announcements. Uh, we just covered the first two. Um, but we we read, uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1, because uh, we're going to look at this final one this morning. But last week, by way of quick review, in case you missed it, uh, we, we know that there were three angelic announcements. Uh, angels came and made the announcement uh, that... Jesus or God was coming into the world. And the first we read about it over in Luke chapter one, the first part there of that chapter. This was to a man by the name of Zacharias. And uh, Zacharias was an was an aged priest, and he was married to a woman named Elizabeth. They were both older and without ch uh, children. And uh, the angel Gabriel came to Zacharias and told him a very important message. And that message was that uh, he and his wife would have a child. Now, their child wouldn't be Jesus, but it would be a man. Uh, and they, he was instructed, you need to call the child John. And uh, it was uh, their child's name. Uh, this is John the Baptist. John the Baptist would be the one who would be the herald to, of Christ. He would be the one proclaiming, uh, that uh, leading the way, announcing, so to speak, 
the coming of Jesus Christ. And we know that if you study the life of John, that's exactly what he did. He, uh, he was uh, spirit-filled, he was a Nazarite from birth, and he was preparing the way for Christ and preparing. And so we, we looked at this announcement uh, last week. The second announcement was to a lady named Mary, and this was in Nazareth, and same chapter over in Luke. And the Gabriel informed Mary of a few things. Um, perhaps the, the biggest was that she would experience a supernatural conception. She was uh, a virgin. She had not been with a man, and uh, she was espoused or engaged to Joseph, but uh, uh, there, uh, Jesus uh, uh, did not have an earthly father. <laughs> It, um, and so this was a supernatural conception. And uh, we saw uh, this announcement, or we looked at this announcement last week. Well, I want to look at the the second, or the, the excuse me, the third, the last announcement that we read about in Scripture. Angelic announcements leading up to uh, the birth of Jesus. And this one actually is found in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. So the announcement to Zacharias, the announcement to Mary, that was in Luke chapter 1. But go back to uh, the gospel of, according to Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. And let's pick up in um, verse 18. We see another announcement being made to Joseph. And uh, verse 18, let's, let's just read, or I'll read, you can follow along. Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 18. The Bible says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all of this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, or which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from, uh, from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took him unto him his wife." and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Well, we see here this uh, angel, this angelic announcement. Now, this was at a time probably after Mary had returned from her visit with Elizabeth, and um, we're going to get into that here in a second. Mary would have been uh, about three months pregnant at this time, and uh, by this time, she likely would have been starting to show, and um, this was this announcement was given uh, specifically in verse twenty to Joseph, and you know the absence of uh, really you don't know we don't know too much about Joseph um, it, from the Word of God, uh, especially during you don't read about Joseph during Jesus's public ministry. It might suggest that Joseph was an older man, uh, much older than Mary. Uh, maybe he had passed away by then. Uh, we, we don't know. But we see that here the angel of the Lord, as the Bible says, instructed Joseph, Joseph who was facing a di great dilemma, if you think about this, uh, to, marry Mo uh, to, to, to marry to Mary Mary. I was just, I caught myself. You saw me catch myself uh, to marry Mary. Um, he was in a dilemma, right? He's engaged to Mary, and then he learns that 
she's with child, and so he's in a dilemma. Um, now, the angel of the Lord, now this, this was just a regular old angel, uh, I guess. It doesn't say it was Gabriel, um, but the, the Bible doesn't specify if this was Gabriel, the same angel that visited Zacharias and, um, and, uh, and Mary. So according to Ken Connor, this is just a regular old angel. I'm saying this for him. All right. But the angel instructed Joseph. He was facing a great dilemma here. And we know, according to the Bible, that Joseph, a couple things we do know about him. The Bible says he was a just man. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, it tells us that Joseph, being a just man, and um, what that means is he was conscientious to follow the law. It doesn't mean Joseph was perfect. He was not a perfect, sinless man. But he was very conscientious to obey the law. And you understand the law at that time, the, the law, the Jewish law, imposed a death penalty for this sort of thing. You know, at, at best, a woman in Mary's condition would expect a public shaming. Much different than our society today, is it not? Um, back then, and you, we won't turn there, but the book of Deuteronomy. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 22, uh, verse 23 and 24, you can see what the law uh, imposed there. At the very least, Mary was going to be publicly shamed for being uh, unfaithful. For uh, She was with child. Everyone could see it. There was really no way to hide it. Um, so the law imposed a death penalty, but tradition also, uh, Jewish tradition, allowed Joseph to have a divorcement. Now, I know he was engaged, but back then, an, uh, be, uh, uh, and being espoused or an engagement was just as binding as actual marriage. And so tradition allowed Joseph to divorce or get out of this, to get a bill of divorcement. The, um, the Mishnah or the Jewish law made provision for a bill of divorcement, which you know, would have released Mary from the betrothal. But Joseph's response, and we ended last week by looking at Zacharias's response to the angel's message, Mary's response to the angel's message. Mary's response was a, was a wonderful response. It was submission to the will of God. Joseph's response to the angelic instruction that is given to him here was also submission to the will of God. Look in verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. I guess what I'm trying to say is all of society would have allowed Joseph to get out of this. And, and probably everything in Joseph's head was telling him, run from Mary. She's a liar. She's, she's, uh, you need to, this is your opportunity. And all of society was backing that decision. Yet, what do we see Joseph, a just man who minded the law, do? He listened to the angel of the Lord and took unto him his wife. The whole world would have said, nope, you don't need to do that. Um, but he would then have quietly, no doubt, arranged for their marriage to take place. And, you know, he also bared the reproach that would inevitably come from this. Um, and so, you know, it really says a lot about this man, Joseph, uh, and what he did. You know, it, Christianity following following what this book tells us to do as, as Christians, to live a life uh, that follows Christ. Understand, more and more today, it goes against the flow of this world and what laws in uh, this country say. And even today, um, you know, in the matter of, uh, of, of women's rights with 
uh, with with children. I mean, it the society says terminate the pregnancy, right? And all the laws are are turning to that way to make it easier and easier. And we know Mary didn't do that. I don't know if they had those options back then. Likely not. But we see Joseph getting a message from the Lord by the angel, and he uh, certainly responded with submission to the will of God. And so leading up to the birth of Jesus, we have these angelic announcements, three of them, to Zacharias, to Mary, and then thirdly, later on, to Joseph. And so um, what I want us, though, to to move on to um, next is looking at some of the songs of joy. You know, we talked about the responses of these three people, Zacharias, Mary, and Joseph, how they responded to the angel's message. And we know Zacharias at first um, had some disbelief, Um, but Mary and Joseph responded according to the will of God. And so I want to look at... um, the uh, we turn now um, to back to Luke chapter one. This is where we were last week. Turn over to Luke chapter one. And this is a very long chapter, eighty verses. And earlier on in the chapter, we looked at this last week. The angel Gabriel's announcement to Zacharias, and um, then we get into. Um, Verse 26, we see uh, the angel's announcement there to Mary. And I want to now look at, uh, get down to verse 39. So following again the narrative here, um, Mary goes and visits with Elizabeth. And there were some songs of praise that came forth. And it's thought that Zacharias and Elizabeth, they lived in the Judean hill country. And uh, so Mary's journey would have uh, taken, probably covered close to 100 miles. And so probably taken four or five days at least. And uh, the first song that I want to look at here is uh, the song of Elizabeth that we see and read about in uh, beginning in verse number 39. So we're in Luke chapter 1, verse number 39. And uh, Mary uh, comes here. So the Bible says in verse 39, And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe, remember Elizabeth, was with child with John uh, John the Baptist. The babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears. The babe leapt in my womb for joy, and blessed is she that, uh, that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And so this is Elizabeth's uh, response or or song that we see. And uh, Mary's arrival um, started this. First thing that we see is a response from the unborn John the Baptist. We see that at the end of verse 41. And you know what this tells me? Uh, We see that the babe, John, leapt in her womb. And uh, the response from the unborn child. The unborn children, again, the Bible shows us this. Science, true science shows us this. Unborn children are fully human. 
They can respond to external uh, stimuli. And that's exactly what we see John doing here. You know, um, and, and we know furthermore that a fetus, uh, you know, John was not fully, he wasn't born yet. He was still in the womb. But look in verse 44, they can express emotion. Um, it says, for lo, as soon as the voice of, of thy salutation, as soon as Mary's voice was heard, what do you see the baby in Elizabeth's belly or her womb uh, doing? It sounded in her ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Now, obviously, I've never experienced having a babe in my womb, but I certainly know in talking with my wife and, you know, I, I, when uh, it's moms can feel that reaction of with the baby and, and um, it, it's, um, they, they can hear what's going on. And so this response from the unborn baby, John the Baptist, we also see that there was a filling of the Holy Ghost. And in verse 41, this at the end of verse 41, we see that Elizabeth, the Bible says, was filled with the Holy Ghost. And this enabled Elizabeth to prophesy about what God was doing in Mary's life. Now, just a, a, a minor point uh, to just remind you about, understand in the Old Testament and leading up to really the day of Pentecost, which was 33 years later, 34 mm -hmm. years later from this point, that's when the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost indwells the believer. The Holy Ghost did not indwell the believer up to this point, but the Bible says the Holy Ghost filled Elizabeth, and this allowed Elizabeth to prophesy in the next verses about what was going to happen in Mary's life, what God was doing in her life. And we see in verse 42 that there's a blessing upon Mary. Um, she and she spake, uh, Elizabeth spake with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. The, you know, this was a, this is a, a, this is why I say the song of Elizabeth. I think this is a spontaneous singing that is happening with Elizabeth. And this was no worship of Mary. Understand this. Um, this was not. Elizabeth worshiping Mary, she said, blessed among women. It was a praise of God for sending his son into the world. And so she knew that Mary, in Mary, inside Mary was the son of God. And it was praising and worshiping the son of God. You know, it's interesting, um, a lot of um, some people think, well, Mary is blessed above all women. The Bible doesn't say that. It says she's blessed among women. It's an interesting study because um, I, was, I was looking into this a little bit yesterday. There's only one woman in the Bible that is said to be blessed above other women. Anyone know who that is? Anyone know? It's a lady by the name of Jael. Anyone know who Jael is? Oh, boy. If you want some exciting reading, um, look up Jael in Judges chapter 5. Uh, Jael, Judges chapter 5, verse 20. Um, I don't know why the Bible says she is the only woman blessed above women, um, but the story of Jael is an interesting one. Um she, um, uh, she, <laughs> she, I guess she's, besides being known as the only woman blessed above women, um, uh, she, uh, put a nail through the temple of a general in the Canaanite army, uh, Sisera. And, uh, Sisera was the enemy and he, uh, she, uh, he found his way into the tent or, uh, to where Jael 
was staying and uh he asked for water he was um he was thirsty well jael knowing it was the enemy uh canaanite general um she didn't give him water she gave him warm milk and made something buttery the bible says and probably he uh probably fell asleep and then when he fell asleep took a nail the bible says with a hammer and right into his head and um anyway um interesting story there's a lot of action in the bible right <laughs> anyway complete side note other than the fact um is we're talking about mary being blessed among women not above women um again some religions place uh mary at an equal level with jesus thinking that and we talked about this i i might have been a couple weeks ago and uh catholicism they pray to mary we know we we don't we don't pray to mary we don't pray through mary we pray uh to god through jesus christ he's the uh a mediator mary is not the mediator she was human just like you and i she was sinful just like you and i but she was willing to be used by god and god used her for a wonderful a wonderful purpose so we see some things in this song from elizabeth we see the not only the response of the unborn child we see this filling of the holy ghost this blessing upon mary uh, but we also see a recognition of the identity of Mary's unborn baby. In Luke chapter 1, verse 43, Elizabeth sings, And from whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And the, the Holy Spirit, no doubt, had allowed Elizabeth to know that Mary's child was not just any old regular child. This was the son of God. And Elizabeth knew that. And she was excited to, uh, she knew that the son of God was, was there. And then we see in the verse 45, a confirmation that Elizabeth gives Mary that her faith would be rewarded understand this was tough for mary to, to to believe right uh she obviously knew that she hadn't been with a man but she's finds herself with child and she has uh this uh announcement from gabriel that uh what god's gonna do in her life but this was this couldn't have been easy for mary but elizabeth strengthens her faith by confirming what the angel of the Lord said unto her. And so, you know, this is, this is uh, in the New Testament, might be one, really one of the, the first of the New Testament hymns. Um, hymns have been written out of this portion of Scripture. We know there's obviously a lot of hymns that we sing even today that are Old Testament, but as you get into the New Testament, this is the first instance of, of that you know it made me think a little bit about um studying this it made me think a little bit about you know songs we sing and you know as as i was thinking about this i jotted down some some things songs we sing um being praise focused um, and what I mean by that is it triggers a moving or a stirring of the Holy Spirit in our life the songs that we listen to and sing uh, stir up the Holy Spirit in our life. Not the flesh, and you understand the difference, right? When your flesh is being stirred and when the Spirit is being stirred. I hope you understand the difference. Um, the word blessed that's used here, blessed or, you know, another name or word for blessed is happy. The songs that we sing and as you think about songs we sing today in church in our as we meet together in church do they make you feel happy or do they put you down a lot of music today is kind of depressing um it you know songs that we sing they ought to 
bless us or make us happy. Put us in a good mood and, and certainly give us a right focus. Um, songs, there was a, in, in this, and we talked about that fourth point there, a recognition of the identity of Mary's unborn baby. I think songs that we sing today certainly should have a recognition of God in it, who he is, what he's done in our life. Um, and then a strengthening of our faith. A lot of songs and hymns that we sing in our hymn book, and there's other songs. Boy, the best ones are ones that strengthen our faith. And how does it do that? Well, maybe it reminds us of a, uh, which is what Elizabeth is doing with Mary here, is she's reminding Mary what the angel of the Lord said unto you, it's going to come true. So I think about, songs of praise that remind us of the promises of God. When we sing songs about heaven um, and glory land, things that we have to, that we should be looking forward to, we haven't experienced that yet, but boy, they're confirmation. They should strengthen our faith. And so as I was studying this section of scripture, I, I started to think about, well, are the songs that I'm listening to, are they, are they moving the spirit of God in my life or are they moving the flesh? Are they appealing to the flesh? Are they making me happy? Having my mind focused on God or are they strengthening my faith? And so we see um, these songs of joy, these songs of joy. Um, Let's let me move on and we'll cover these last two a little quicker. We then move on in the uh, same chapter. We then move on to Mary's songs, her joyful songs. Um, in verse 46, as we read into the next verses, we come to Mary. And I'll point out a few things about Mary's song here. So let me just read verse 46. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name." And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in his imagination, er, in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. He, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever, and Mary abode with, um, with her about three months and returned to her own house. And so we then see after Elizabeth's song, we then see Mary and her joyful singing. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and this song, let me just point out a few things. It certainly is a hymn of faith. I would say it's modeled after um, another lady's song. If, if you go to First Samuel, don't turn there, but First Samuel chapter 2, you see uh, a lady by the name of Hannah. And it's a wonderful um, song of praise that Hannah sings. And it certainly is modeled after there. Uh, after Hannah's prayer. These words, though, <clears throat> that we uh, read here in Luke chapter 1, they declare a few things. First of all, we see they declare the power of God. They declare the holiness of God. The grace and mercy, we just read this, uh, the grace and mercy of God and the immutability and truth of God. He's unchanging. In there in verse 55, he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. God's the same yesterday, today and forever. He doesn't change. And certainly this was a hymn of humility. Um, in verse 47, 
She says, My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaid. Um, and so there was um, Mary acknowledged her need of a Savior there. She was not sinless, as I mentioned earlier. She acknowledged she had to get saved. She had to trust and believe in the Lord just like you and I do. But um, Bible tells us Mary remained with Elizabeth. Uh, and probably until uh, Elizabeth delivered John the Baptist or came close to full term, if you do the math there, um, it's possible that Mary was present there when John came into the world. But we see another song of joy a song sung by Mary. So we have the song of Elizabeth, we have the song of Mary. And uh, then, then finally, and I'll just, um, I'll just give you this because we are running out of time. But we see the the song here, or the praise that is sung by Zacharias, and you know there obviously was much interest in the birth of John because you know given the age of Zacharias and Elizabeth, they were in their years, and. We see um, in this portion of scripture uh, the naming of John, um, and we won't read this. It's a long portion of uh, uh, it's really through the end of the chapter. But you know the custom at this time, certainly for the firstborn, was to name the firstborn son after uh, the the first uh, male child. Um, the custom was to name them on the day of their circumcision which would be eight days after they were born. Another custom would be that they would be given the father's name or some other family patriarch name. Uh, but both Elizabeth and Zacharias said, may, they made it clear, no, his name is John. And so this, again, goes, and why did they say that? Well, they were told his name shall be called John. And so they're following through with what the angel had told them. And um, I don't know how Zacharias um, told his wife this. Remember, he was dumb. He couldn't speak. And Elizabeth wasn't there when the angel met with Zacharias. But I'm sure he had a way to, to relay God's message about the name of the child. But we see starting in verse 67, we see um, Zacharias praising. And, you know, the, it's interesting because the last words uttered by Zacharias in the temple, when he was told all of these things would come, they were words of doubt. Remember last week? If you go to uh, verse 18, if you turn back maybe a page, Luke chapter 1, verse 18. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife, well stricken in years. So words of doubt. And then God struck him with dumbness. <laughs> he couldn't speak. So he hadn't spoken this whole time. And now we see uh, John born. And now his first words after the miracle happens. He's delivered from his dumbness. They were words of faith and praise to God. In verse 67, we see, and, the, and his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. What are the first words in verse 68? Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. And so he saw the promise. He saw the miracle happen. He and his wife were too old to have kids. God worked a miracle there and their words of faith and their words of praise. And I'll leave you with this. It's actually is a beautiful hymn of praise. And it even has five stanzas. <laughs> if you, if you want to go, you can see, I, I just have it on the screen. We won't read this, but you know, stanza verse number one is, is praising God for his salvation. And uh, then we see a praise there starting in verse 70. 
uh, for his promises and uh, and how God always follows through with his promises. We see uh, a praise for God's covenant, a praise for uh, the ministry of John, that John um, is going to be used of God and and, uh, you know, as parents, I think that's any godly parent. That's what we want. We want our kids to be used for the Lord. And then we see at the end, verse number five, or stanza number five, a praise for Jesus's mission. Uh, there is starting in verse 78. And so, uh, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And so a wonderful song of praise or a hymn of praise that we see Zacharias uh, giving us here after the birth of John. And so anyway, uh, we'll end right there next week. Um, Lord willing, we'll get into the birth of Jesus and start looking at some of the events that occurred at that time. And so uh, thank you for your attention. You are dismissed.